Welcome to Fat Chicks on Top. This podcast contains frank discussions about the body, sexuality, and occasionally uses swear words, which may not be appropriate for people under the age of 18. This podcast also uses facts, statistics, and mathematics, which may not be appropriate for liberal arts majors. And this podcast relies on science and reality, which may not be appropriate for evangelicals. Welcome to Fat Chicks on Top. You are here with your host, Auntie Vice, and it's good to be back. Today, I have one of the founders of the Philly Fat Clothing Swap, Philly Fat Con, fat activist, generally awesome person all around, Donnell Jagerman, correct? Yes. Welcome to the show. It's good to have you here. My question to to start is, how did you get into body liberation and fat activism? Oh, this is such a fun question because I find it so interesting how people have come into this space because it's so interdisciplinary. Um, I actually came in it really from a fashion space, which I don't think is um, unique because, you know, we have to wear clothes every day. And so that is such a pain point for most of us, right? Shopping, finding clothes that we like that also fit us. Um, And I really came at this through actually the sustainable fashion movement, um, where I was trying to find sustainable ways to dress and clothe myself. And that's kind of how I started the Plus Swap, which is a clothing swap just for uh, plus sizes. And it's, it's so important because for any of us who are bigger bodied and has tried to shop in secondhand clothing stores, most of the time they don't go above a 16. Yeah. And I mean, even regular clothing stores, right? Right. <laughs> um, and, then, and then when you try to get into what we call slow fashion brands or ethical fashion brands where these clothes are new, um, but maybe they're created with natural fibers or dead stock materials that already exist and aren't being used anymore by another brand or, you know, are created with sustainable materials, the brand choices and the style choices just start getting more and more narrow. And so that community gets really small too. Which is absurd because most of us, at least in the U.S., are over a size 16. There's like 40% of us, right? Yeah, I think it's actually even higher now, which is why some brands like Universal Standard have started to use that size as their standard pattern size. But it just seems like, you know, we're kind of left out of the fashion world just on the surface level. And then as you start to get into niche styles or if you're really into a certain look or a certain fabric, it just gets so much harder and harder to shop, find your size, and then like even return items, right? You can't just like send stuff back if you get it custom made. When you initially started the the swap, did you have a good turnout? Has it built over time? Like what's the response to it in your area? It was actually so surprising. So the whole conversation around the swap started with an Instagram community um, called Sell Trade Plus. And it is a essentially an Instagram consignment shop. You submit pieces. The um, person who runs it, Corinne Fay, um, posts them. And then people can say they're interested in buying it. And you select a random person. And then every Friday, uh, they host a open thread right? Where people can ask for advice. They can say, you know, I'm looking for this or that. And some people started talking about never being able to like trade clothes with their friends or their family members, right? And I've I've had that experience too. I have a sister. We never were able to trade clothes as children. I was never able to trade with my friends, which seems crazy, Um, but it just never was the right size or style. 
And I said, okay, well, if you're interested and you live within driving distance of Philadelphia, send me a message and I'll add you to this group chat. So before I knew it, there was like 40 people in the chat. And I was like, oh my God, well, this isn't going to happen in my living room anymore, right? right? Like we need a space. So fast forward a few months, um, someone helped me find a space at a place called Bartram's Garden, which is a nonprofit like outdoor and event space in Philadelphia. They rented us their barn for (laughs) on a Sunday morning. I think I charged like $10 for the tickets, which was really just a way to like make sure people were going to come, right? Even if you charge $5, people are more likely to show up. And I sold out of tickets multiple times, um, had to like reopen more tickets and just thought, I can't believe that this many people want to come. And we had almost 80 people at the first swap. That's incredible. That is fantastic. And shout out to Corinne. She does her Substack. Um, yes. Big girl panties. Big which undies. Is quite enjoyable. Yeah. Big undies. Or big undies. Yes. That's it. Big undies. <laughs> yes. I'm a fan. <laughs> I love anybody who comes into the movement through fat fashion because it is a sticking point mm-hmm. for most of us. And then you add on other things like I'm over six feet tall with the 34 inch inseam. Yeah. And it just gets increasingly more, you know, I'm built like a linebacker, except I have a huge chest to accommodate. So, you know. And you don't, might, you might not want to wear linebacker clothes, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so from that, then how did you get connected with Philly FatCon? So I'm actually the original, one of the original founders. All three of us are really. But Adrian Ray, who um, formerly owned Curb Conscious, was w- which was a plus size um, consignment and resale shop in Philadelphia, um, has been a friend of mine. I met her through the swap years ago when she first, or not through the swap, through her consignment shop years ago when she first opened and I had moved to Philadelphia. And she had donated clothes um, for the first swap and um, really helped me promote it across social media. And so she was involved in the first swap in 2021. And then we actually serendipitously met Kenyatta Harris, who at the time had Curvy and Seductive, which was a plus size lingerie brand. We met her kind of like Adrian, like she ran into Adrian at a pop up shop after Adrian's store had closed. And then she showed up at a women's like professional happy hour I was hosting (laughs) for my other half of my life. Right. And I said, well, let's like, why don't you both come to the clothing swap next year? I was already planning a second one. And so they both had pop ups um, at at the second plus swap um, in 2022. And we were just sitting around, not really sitting around, but standing around exhausted at the swap, looking at the, you know, 80 or 90 people that were there. And we're just amazed that so many people had showed up. And the room was just buzzing. We had a mending table. We had um, a couple other vendors there, um, including Lobo Mao, which is a Philly sustainable clothing brand. And we're like, we have to make this like bigger next year, right? It can't, it has so much potential and we just really need something like this in the community. And so you developed Philly FatCon. Tell our listeners a little bit about what this is, because it's much bigger than just clothing and fashion. Yes. So really, obviously, it kind of grew out of and developed out of the clothing swap. But even the swap was never just a swap. It was always a swap and a shop, right? I always had vendors at it, even from the first one, um, because it was always a like for the community, right? It was never to make money or to, you know, get awards or praise or whatever. It was like, let's support businesses. Let's keep clothes out of the trash, right? So when Adrian Kenyatta and I were conceptualizing a bigger event um, in the fall of 2022, we actually started planning Philly FatCon 23 in November of 2022. So we planned it for almost a full year before it happened, which is just incredible amount of work that we did. But Adrian had had this idea for years to have a plus size or like a fat talent show. And it had never gotten off the ground because, you know, COVID happened and this and that and whatever. But she always had this idea of showcasing fat talent 
we were like, well, what if we had like panels and speakers? And then Kenyatta is actually a um, pole dancing instructor um, and a burlesque performer herself. And she said, well, what if we have, you know, movement classes, fitness classes for fat people? And I said, well, we have to keep the swap involved because I definitely want to do it again. And that's like really where this audience started building itself up and this community came from. Um, and so that's how we started pulling together this multi-day convention that involves like keynote speakers, panels on hot topics. This year, we're actually going to have an interactive workshop with NAFA and the Campaign for Size Freedom. And we have a party, too. Um, which is just really cool. Um, it's a fat costume party. And the, you know, thought about that was like always this anxiety about like wearing a costume and being a fat person, right? And like also how many costumes make fun of fat people. You know, so like Halloween and costumes can be such a sensitive area for people. And what a joyful experience to go to a costume party that's just fat people. And like watch fat burlesque, right? And dance to whatever you want to dance to and have snacks and not feel like anybody's judging you. Um, so we just kind of started creating all the events that we wish we had had when we were coming into this space. And it's definitely accelerated all of our understanding and participation and involvement in body liberation as well. So you talk about the movement classes, and this is one thing that a lot of folks, even bigger body folks, have internalized beliefs around that bigger people can't dance elegantly, can't move the same mm -hmm. way as others. So as you've participated in these and had, you know, you've had different instructors out to teach during this, what has changed with your own relationship with your body and movement? Oh, this is such a great question. I have always enjoyed and been like a little competitive. But in my youth and growing up, even if it weren't for my body size, I just didn't have like the stable household that was needed to like participate in group sports. I'm sure there's a lot of people that can identify with that. Um, it requires like a lot of commitment to get your parents to take you to these kind of things. Um, and so I just felt like there was like never a place for me. And then as I, you know, my body changed and stuff, you know, I started looking for places in that community that felt comfortable to me. And I think the first place was a yoga um, class that was specifically for people in larger bodies. And that community, I think, is just more set up to work in that space, I think, because it's not just about movement. Yoga isn't, right? It's about like the self-learning and understanding and meditation and a spiritual component as well for a lot of people. Um, and so I definitely look at it like as all bodies are capable now and that, you know, we can't judge a book by its cover either. I think also the Olympics this year was just such an amazing example of body diversity in athletics and fitness and movement that I hope everyone was inspired by that too. I absolutely loved it. What was your favorite sport this year to watch? Oh, I obviously love rugby because Alona Mar is just such an amazing personality, but I am like a swimmer at heart. You know, I've been asking people like, if you could compete in any Olympic event and be automatically good at it, what would you do? And then if you could compete in one that like you definitely, that kind of like works with your personality or who you are now, which one would that be? And for me, the one that I would just like die to do is the breaststroke. Like I love swimming. I managed the swim team in college. <laughs> so that I love watching the swimming races. I, I was a swimmer through high school uh, on yeah. the team. And my sister used to call my butterfly the dead moth. That was one I could I could never <laughs> master. You know? Oh, that is a really hard one. <laughs> yeah, that one. But breaststroke was a little easier. But yeah, the butterfly freaking killed me um, in swimming. Yeah, that's a true talent. <laughs> it is. It is. Swimmers are absolutely amazing. And like you, I loved the rugby. I love watching mm -hmm. women just get out there and rough and tumble, and it's inspiring. You know, you talk about yoga being more about 
the meditation and the breath and any of us who've practiced yoga know that but you also had a a woman who came and taught twerking and burlesque yeah yes and we often we've had uh other folks on who are bigger bodied burlesque performers on the show but what's the experience that you get feedback on when your attendees get to see bigger bodied people being sexy on stage Mm -hmm. i think it's something that everyone knows within themselves that people like them are sexy I think they see other people that have similar body shapes to them sometimes, or maybe it's a little different or whatnot. And they think and they see that person performing or dancing or moving or in a movie or something. And they think, oh, you know, I couldn't do that. Right. Or like, I don't have have the guts. But then they get to watch somebody do it and learn behind closed doors in a room with people who also look like them and have no idea what they're doing. And I think it's just this revelation that, again, like all bodies are capable and of of doing these things and with or without modifications. Um, but you have to really give yourself a chance. And I think it's just kind of like a breath of fresh air for some people. Some people got very emotional at the costume party where we have the burlesque performances. You know, I saw someone getting like really teary eyed. I think they were had been overwhelmed with anxiety at the thought of like participating in the costume party. But then you see this person come out in their lingerie to dance in front of everyone. And I think it's freeing. Right. And I think they see those people having so much confidence. And I think it rubs off on everyone. So when you're you're putting these together, you also do a number of panels and you brought up finding hot topics to talk about. You're in the process of setting all the speakers and stuff for this year's. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the things you guys are going to cover? Well, we'll definitely have a fashion element again. I think that will always be part of Philly Fat Con um, because of the way that the um, event was originated and because it is such a pain point and also a point of like pleasure and creativity and expression um, and just like social justice, right? They all deserve to wear clothes. So I think that will main, remain a hot topic that we talk about every year, um, but some of the others will fluctuate. And sometimes it just has to do occasionally with like what kind of speaker applications we get, right? We get a lot of interest from people in the mental health profession who are therapists themselves, are fat therapists, or um, specialize in intuitive eating or eating disorders, fat liberation or body neutrality, right? And we hear people and see the pain of that people have around some of these subjects, right? This year, we our original location was supposed to be in an art school, in a um, University of the Arts in Philly. It announced its closure um, before we, or kind of like after we had already settled on some topics. So we wanted to have like a an artsy theme this year. So one of our topics is fat bodies in art and literature. Um, so we're We'll have two authors who are fat and two um, artists who um, work with different media, a lot of paint, um, though, and then that'll be moderated by someone who is a curator of art and is also fat herself. Um, And then we will actually also have um, three out of the four cast members of the documentary Thick Skin that was filmed specifically on these um, four people who live in larger bodies in the city of Philadelphia. And it was um, actually funded by a pharmaceutical brand. So we wanted to come and have them talk about the experience, about what it was like to work with a, you know, funding like that. If there was like anything that they were really involved in, or if it was just kind of, they signed the check and also just, you know, explore what the experience was like being filmed and answering these questions about your life while being fat, right? The two others we have, um, one is on sensuality, sexuality, and relationships. That is um, a rather popular topic, obviously. 
We will also have, and then we have our fifth one is actually a workshop with NAFA to talk about how to get involved in their campaign for size freedom. So it'll be a little bit more hands-on. And shout out to NAFA. We've had Tigress Ob- Osborne on the show. She is a force of nature. Yeah. She is. And we will link to that as well as the campaign um, in the show notes for our listeners. And- um, I don't want to, I'll be missed to mention, not mention, our keynote speaker is Roz the Diva Maze. And she's going to talk about gym intimidation. So just like we were talking earlier about, you know, being physically active and participating in the fitness arena, um, she's going to come and talk about that and how to get over that. That's awesome. You bring up that in literature. Who are your favorite authors that include fatness in their storylines? I'm probably not the best person to this. <laughs> um, I am definitely need to get into reading more. I'm not the book talk girl um, that so many girl with you, so many people are these days, but I'm really excited that um, Emma Copley Eisenberg, who just wrote Housemates, is going to come. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading that. I haven't picked it up yet, um, but um, it's gotten so many good reviews and we're really excited. Um, I, Although it's not storytelling per se, but um, Virginia Soulsmith, obviously have to call her out as a fat author who writes on these subjects. Fat Talk is such an amazing book and you also have to listen to her podcast, Burnt Toast. She she's great and uh she does both the podcast and the Substack newsletter. Yes. Yeah. For those of us who who prefer reading over Yeah, listening. that's <laughs> she has a good mix. You can also read her podcast too. So if you if you'd rather read it, you can you can read along. You have all this coming. You've been doing this for a couple of years now. What has changed for you in going through putting all of this together? How have you changed through this process? I wouldn't say that I'm even more now aware of things like mobility and fitting into spaces. I myself have operated in this kind of like small fat body for most of my life. And so doing this and trying to create spaces and experiences for fat people People has really opened my eyes to the range of barriers, right? And how even though I might sit just fine in the desk chair that I picked out, that it is not accommodating to so many other people um, who also identify as fat or large body um, or chubby or whatever it is, right? And that has really influenced me to speak up even in other parts of my life. In my day job, I am a healthcare strategy expert. Um, and I work for um, a healthcare analytics and intelligence research company. And I actually oversee our thought leadership in orthopedics. And organizing this and being more involved in fat liberation creeps into my day job every day. When I hear people say fat phobic things, like someone not realizing at our company that osteoarthritis is a disease in itself and it is not caused by obesity. Obesity in quotes for people who can't see me Um, by having a larger body mass. It is a disease of your joints and cartilage that can impact anyone of any size. But being larger bodied and carrying more weight can exacerbate that, right? It can make it hurt more. It can give you more symptoms. But just because you are a larger body doesn't mean you will get osteoarthritis, right? And just because you have osteoarthritis doesn't mean you are larger bodied. And so these conversations have found their way into my daily work life as well. Um, and that does feel very new. And I, I definitely feel more prepared to have those kind of conversations in professional settings too. That's awesome. You are online as part of Philly Fat Con, you do the the swap. What is it like being a fat woman online? Oh, I was actually just talking to Tigress about this yesterday. Um, we had a call with her. And you know what? There has been a lot of 
um, trolling by conservative media about Philly FatCon, especially last year. Um, and I know the Seattle FatCon also had um, a similar experience. And we are not um, the same entity. We're two completely different groups of people who created these events separately and have, you know, come and know each other now and and have our own community and collaboration. But sometimes it's easier to not feed into the haters. And that's kind of like where my, I tend to lean is like delete and block, right? I know some people try to like expose the bad comments or, you know, like show them so that other people realize what you're going through and how bad the bullying is. Um, but for my mental health, and I think for other founders as well, Adrian and Kenyatta, we have decided to not engage with any of them. No, not with conservative media, not with trolls on on Instagram, not with the mean comments that people wrote under our article by the Philadelphia Inquirer when it was posted on Facebook. Because it's just like negativity. Like we didn't invite them anyway, right? So like, why are you worried about our event? You weren't invited. I think that also like being small fat again, there are people who don't see me as fat. (laughs) I wear like a size 18. um, So I'm like closer to mid fat now, but not that we need to categorize things, things, but I think there are people in my life who don't think I'm fat. (laughs) And I think that can be a really strange experience, but I don't, I'm not active enough to get like hate comments about being fat, I guess. Um, But I do sympathize a lot with the people that do. And um, you don't see those comments on Philly Fat Con because if we do get them, we delete them and block them. That's excellent. That's excellent. You talked about accessibility and accommodations. How has it been as an event organizer to find things like seating that accommodates larger fat bodies it is so difficult and auntie vice i'm so glad you asked this because i don't know if people know how hard it is philadelphia is a very historical city and so many of the buildings are very old right so let's even before we get to seating let's think about staircases and elevators and ramps and doorway sizes Right. And then like these buildings that are cobbled together and you have to like there's like a random three steps once you get to the second floor to go down into another part of the building that was connected later. Like it is chaos (laughs) and it's really expensive to get into buildings that do have all the necessary components to make it 100 percent accessible. It's very expensive. And then when you get to seating. Now, some events in some spaces have just folding chairs because they have to store them. And, you know, we go and we sit on every chair (laughs) and we try them and we say, oh, don't know, this is going to work or not. Right. And we ask as much as we can about the weight requirements and we're ensured that, oh, this is up to this weight and everything. But we have had to push back a lot on the chairs that have been in spaces that we have looked at and renting furniture is very expensive and if you want to rent chairs they're almost all folding chairs right Um, so it is a struggle and I hope that everyone knows we are absolutely doing the best that we can to, to make it work and to provide like secure stable structured seating for everyone I like to bring that up because people who have not tried to plan an event with seating that accommodates a large range of body sizes, do not understand how much that adds to the cost if Mm -hmm. you can find a provider to bring in those types of seats. Because the worst thing is when I show up at a conference and they just have those little white folding chairs that max out at like 225. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you just, I have had so many guests on this show Right. I have had so many guests on the show who have had the experience of being a panelist. Those are the only things available and having the chair break underneath them during the panel. Oh, my gosh. So, what a nightmare. Right. And even when you're with a fat group of people, it's still mortifying. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's a good thing that Kenyatta, Adrian, and I are such confident, outspoken 
people because when you go in and you get a tour of a space and you have someone who has never thought about this before, even though they're an event organizer or they're the director of events at a huge university or whatever it is, right? And you look at the chair and you're like, is this the only chair? Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, they have no idea that it's a problem. It's never crossed their minds. And so you start saying, okay, are there any other chairs? Can we take these chairs and can we move them to a different place? Can we split the chairs? And they just start having a logistic panic attack. And you're sitting there thinking, am I asking too much? Like, no, we're not. This is an event for fat people. We're not asking for too much. They should accommodate us. Uh, but it can, it wears on you, right? It does wear on you. Well, and even when it isn't specifically for fat folks, there are going to be fat people attending the right. conferences. Yes. <laughs> it, it's so much of, like, thinking about accessibility has so changed. Everything from, you know, can people access the aisles? If people are mm -hmm. in mobility scooters and using mobility aids, where can they access? Are doorways wide enough? Are elevators compatible? Mm -hmm. um, and when you're in a city with older buildings and where a lot of the event spaces are older, on, especially on the East Coast. Yeah. Um, California, we don't have that problem because everything falls down within 100 years. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> on the East Coast, it, it can be very problematic. And I think people get concerned because... A lot of us try to make events affordable, but accommodations add so much expense and it's part of the fat tax. Absolutely. And, you know, like we're very aware of how demoralizing it is, right, to look into a room and see only chairs with arms or to show up at the event and realize that the only handicap accessible way to enter it is through the alley. Like, I hate that, but I don't have a million dollars. Like, the best places that we found were $50,000. And I, I don't know if people know this, but it's just us three, okay? We don't, we're not independently wealthy. <laughs> Um, you know, like we're funding this with our small set of scholar or sponsorships and with ticket sale money. Like this is grassroots over here. So we are trying our best. I think we did a really good job this year, um, but it's never going to be perfect until we can design the building ourselves. So exactly. and I like if you're a fat person and you need a job, get into like civil engineering, architecture, design, like let's tear it up. Well, and I like to get that out there because there will be pushbacks of, well, it's too expensive or whatever, mm. but understanding what goes into putting an event on, not only are you donating all of your time, there's a tremendous amount of self-funding here. Absolutely. And, okay, even today, I have a full-time job <laughs> um, and I'm spending three hours of my day just in meetings or calls for Philly FatCon on top of my regular job. It is not sustainable to make this your full-time career, in my opinion, or at least like mentally for me either. Um, and we do try to keep the tickets as affordable as possible. We have two different scholarship opportunities this year where we'll, I think, give away at least three free general all-access passes. Um, the Plus Swap will probably give away more standalone tickets for the swap because anytime anyone's ever messaged and said, I really can't afford this, but I really need new clothes. Okay, come. Okay, like we are not turning people down from the clothing swap. Um, maybe from, you know, the costume party. We're not going to be able to let people in scholarships there. But, you know, like we, we try really hard to make the value worth it. So you can come to the convention day on early bird pricing, August 31st. For $100 if you just want to do convention day. That is from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. You have the choice of five movement classes, six different speaking opportunities you can participate in, and dozens of vendors you can shop from, right? 
So we tried to make it as reasonable as possible, but we do have to pay for the space. Yep. yep. And I will rearrange when I drop these to get this out before the 31st. So listeners can <laughs> cash in on those early bird tickets. Cause I think it's a great opportunity for people to go yeah. and connect and all of that. And it also helps us like the early bird tickets help us be able to cover more expenses ahead of it. You've got this year, you're in the planning, you're in the big promotion. Ultimately, where would you like to see this go as an event? It's it's hard to think like while you're in the middle of it and getting so close. Um, Cause what we're two months out now, holy moly. But I would love to see this become like a huge convention. So we had about 150 people actually show up last year. I think we sold over 200 tickets. I would love to see this be like 500 people, right? And three full days of activities, right? And like dozens of different options that you could do throughout the day. I would love to have like aqua aerobics, right? Have it in a hotel and you can go down and do aqua aerobics during the, the convention. And I also think that. It would be really amazing to do this in more cities. So, of course, like the Seattle Fat Con um, popped up. We both popped up organically. But I would love to, you know, see this kind of thing happen in more cities. Don't pick like the city next to us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like Miami or something. And I would also love for the pricing to get less and less expensive. My ideal, especially for the clothing swap, would be that it would be completely free. Or be like $5 just so you have to like get invested a little bit. If it was possible to like bring in that many scholarships or um, sponsorships, that would be one of my objectives. So if we happen to have somebody listening who has some money to throw your way, yeah. plug away what you can do with sponsorship. Make the pitch to my listeners. <laughs> We have everything from $500 and up available. If you're a small business and you pick our small sponsorship package that's $500, you actually get a free general um, admission all access pass. That's worth $250. Plus you get the advertising benefits, right? So if you're a small business and this is your audience, it's a really great deal, right? And we'll accept those um, probably up until like two weeks before convention, just so we can make sure to get your um, logo and stuff in the program. If you're a small business and you might not have the cash, right, to help us out, we also love raffle prizes. So if you have a clothing brand or if you have pretty much anything that's not perishable and you want to help us out and help us raise more money, we would love your raffle prices. We would love samples of your product for our VIP bags. If you're a big brand, we have options all the way up to as much money as you want to spend with us um, that involve blasting you on social media that involve a discount um, for your customers, a special discount code for your customers. All of our packages include free tickets. Um, so we have a ton of options and we'd still love to talk to you about them. Excellent. Where are you finding joy? Oh, it is definitely in the comment section of our posts right now. <laughs> Um, if you check out our Instagram, it is filled with encouragement, with excitement about our performers that we just released. They're all excited. You're excited. Um, and we can already see the community growing. Um, personally, the joy that I see on people's face at the clothing swap every year lasts me an entire year. Just people finding new clothes um, and like finding friends and community at the event when they came alone is just like warms my little heart. Amazing. If our listeners want to get tickets, if they want to follow you on social media, if they want to connect with you for other reasons, plug all your sites and socials. The best place to find us is Instagram. It is at Philly Fat Con. All one word, no punctuation. And you can get to everything from there. But if you're just a website person, we are at www.eventcreate.com backslash Philly Backcon 2024. 
And listeners will have all of those links, plus the other stuff we've plugged throughout the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming out. It was wonderful to talk to you. And good luck on your event. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Fat Chicks on Top. Please like, subscribe, and review our podcast on whatever platform you listen to it on. If we like your review, we may even read it online. This has been an Auntie Vice production. Producer and host, Rebecca Blanton. Audio production by Sharon Smith. Music by David Manga. And more music by Sharon Smith. For more information about Fat Chicks on Top, please visit our website for all things Fat Chicks at fatchicksontop.com.